Since version 4.3, Godot has become a lot more useful for producing web games. Most notably, single-threaded web builds are now possible, which removes the pesky shared array buffer requirement from the site you want to publish on. Single-threaded execution can cause audio problems though. The Godot team has tackled these by reintroducing sample playback, which is less demanding on the CPU. So this is all great news. In this video, I want to go over what I've learned from making a small web game for desktop and mobile, which I've published on crazygames.com a while ago. I am going to build on the application we implemented in the last tutorial video. There we made a tiny tiny game that could be run on mobile and also in a resizable desktop window. This time we are going to take it a step further and produce a web build that can run on mobile as well as on desktop browsers. Especially for mobile, keeping the download size small is really important, so I'm going over some techniques to reduce the size of the build. If you want to follow along with me, it might be a good idea to go over that previous tutorial first before continuing here. Alright. I've been mentioning a different mechanism used for audio playback in web builds. So first of all, let's add sound to the game. I have prepared a few audio assets for you to integrate into the game. You can download them as part of my asset collection on itch.io. Once you've downloaded and unpacked the file, create an audio folder in the project and simply drag these four files into it. These are three simple retro sound effects and a short background music loop, all of which I made in Reaper if you're curious. For the background music, add an audio stream player to the main scene. Now drag the pongmusic.org file into the stream field. I'll reduce the volume by minus 8 dB here. This is going to play all the time in the background. So enable autoplay, then open the parameters section and set looping to on. While we're here, let's speed up the game a little too. It was all rather slow in the first tutorial part. I'm setting the ball move speed to 0.4 and bat speed to 0.6. To play the sound effects, open the ball scene. Again, add an audio stream player node and rename it to SFX. I'm setting the volume to minus 6 dB, a little louder than the background music. We are going to play three different sounds here, so the stream source isn't set directly in the inspector, but from code. Open the ball script. Control drag the player node we just created into that script to create a reference. Now select the three sound effects in the file system view and control drag those into the script as well. This creates constants for the preloaded audio resources. For convenience, let's create a small function to set and play back an audio source. The function takes an audio source, assigns it to the player node and plays it. Simple enough. We are going to play one effect when the ball bounces off a game area boundary. Another one when the ball hits the bat. And finally a nasty sound when the ball goes out of bounds. Now if you take a look at the audio stream player's playback type, you see it offers a choice between stream and sample. I said before that web build should use sample playback to avoid sound issues. Luckily, we don't have to remember adjusting each and every player node depending on the build target. If you open the project settings and enable advanced settings, you'll see a general section appear under audio. There's a setting specifying how audio is played back when an audio stream player node is set to default. For web builds, sample playback is already configured. So we can just leave all the audio stream player nodes at their default setting. And that is all we have to do here. If you want to know more about what is going on under the hood, I recommend this article by Adam Scott on the topic. Let's try out what we have real quick. Alright, now let's move on and produce an actual web build. Go to Project Export. If you don't see the web preset, click the Add button and download the web export template from the Manage Templates dialog. 
If you can't start the download because you are in offline mode, go to Editor Settings, Network, Connection and set the network mode to online. Now let's have a look at the options for the web template. The most important one is thread support. If I tick that box and make a build, the result won't be running unless you put it on a server supporting shared array buffers. When I try to open the page locally, I get this error message. So let's untick thread support and make another build. Now the previous error message went away, but we still can't run the build. This is due to a security restriction when opening the main page as a file. While you might find workarounds for some browsers, you should really set up a local web server for testing. As a first step, we need to set up an SSL certificate to enable a secure connection. You can install OpenSSL binaries from this site here. I'm on a Windows 10 machine, so you might have to do things a little differently if you are on another platform. The general principles are the same though. Open a command prompt and navigate to your build folder. Step 1. Create a private key. You need to enter a passphrase here. Step 2. Generate the certificate. You will be asked for some data to add to the certificate. But for our purposes, it's okay to just confirm most of this with return. It might be necessary to enter at least the server name, just enter localhost here. Now we're ready to set up the actual server. Personally, I like the live server extension and the Visual Studio code editor. So let me briefly show you how to configure it. From within Visual Studio code, install the live server extension. Let's also open our build folder. Now go to the live server extension settings page. Switch to workspace on the top left here. First of all, enter the file name of the main HTML page. Scrolling down a bit, you will find fields where you can enter the certificate data. I am also setting a custom port number. The changes are saved to the settings JSON file in the workspace here. Having done that, we can simply start a local web server by pressing the go live button in the corner down here. This will start the default web browser and load the game. Depending on your browser, you will probably get a warning because we are using a self-signed certificate. Proceed anyway. Also note the port number in the address bar. What's nice about this setup is that we can also easily test the build on a mobile device connected to the same network. For that, we need to know the actual IP address of the computer. You can find this for example by typing ipconfig into a command prompt on Windows. Use the IP address together with the port number we saw earlier to open the build on your mobile device. Whenever you export a new build, you can now simply reload the page on your phone for testing. Typically, you will need your game to communicate with the web browser using JavaScript. Let's do something really simple here and retrieve the browser name and display it in a label. Add a label to the main scene and make it big enough to display a long string. Make sure to enable the WordWrap option. Control drag the label node into the main script. 
In the ready function, if we are running a web build, we fill the label with text. We can use the JavaScript bridge class to execute JavaScript. For this example, we simply evaluate the user agent string and display that in our label. In any other build, we hide the label. When we run the game locally, nothing shows up, as expected. So let's export a new web build. When we reload the page in the browser, the user agent string is displayed. That should be enough to get you started with talking to the browser. Let's now finally look at the elephant in the room, the giant build size. Our game contains next to no code and data, and still the exported build is a whopping 42 max in the release version. If you look at the files in the build folder, this is largely to the WebAssembly file, which contains mostly Godot engine code. To reduce the size of this file, we will now go ahead and build our own custom web export template. This may seem daunting, but really isn't that hard at all. First, you need to get the Godot source code. This is all laid out in the Godot documentation, so I won't bore you with the details here. It is possible to just download a copy of the code from GitHub, but generally you'd want to install some variant of the Git version control system. Which one largely depends on what's available for your operating system and is also a matter of taste. I'm going to stick with the command line interface in the following, which should be the same everywhere. Check your Godot editor version to find out which branch of the source you need to get. In my case, I am on 441 stable. Okay, fine. Our repository is ready. Next, you will need to install a few tools, as explained on this page. You don't need a separate compiler, Visual Studio or anything else. When you're done, it's a good idea to verify the build system is working before starting to mess with the configuration. In the Godot source directory, initialize the environment using this line here, where you need to use the path to your mscript and sdk directory of course. Now we should be able to build a single threaded release version of the web export template from the shell. This is going to take a while. When the build went through, take a look at the results in the bin folder. Note the size of the wasm file. We are going to reuse that significantly in a moment. The zip archive is what we are going to refer to as the export template in the editor. Let's try it out. Switch back to the Godot editor and open the web export settings. Enable the advanced options section. In the text fields that now appear, we can enter the path to our custom template. We have built a release template, so just fill that in. Make a new build. If all goes well, it should run in the browser just the same as before. Now we finally get to the exciting part, customizing the build. Basically, we can strip the engine down to just the bare minimum we need to run the game. To get started, we can use the Godot build options generator. We can go down the list and make educated guesses about what we might be able to remove from the build. A good overview of what to look out for to reduce binary size can be found on this webpage. Leave the production setting alone. As far as I know, this only makes sense for building the editor. It also threw warnings and actually generated a larger build when I activated it. We don't need 3D though, and optimizing for size sounds great, and so on. The result of this is a python file, which we can copy and paste into the custom.py file in the Godot source directory. This file can be freely edited. For example, we can add the threads equals no option to make our command line shorter. Let's build the export template again. As
as you can see, the size of the WASM file has already been reduced quite a bit. At the time I'm recording this, the options generator tool was last updated for Godot 4.2, so it is lacking some of the available options. To browse all the available build flags you could potentially put in your custom Python file, use this command line. To really squeeze all the extra bytes out of the build is going to take quite a bit of experimentation and of course depends largely on the engine features your project makes use of. You will need to test thoroughly. Sometimes a missing feature will simply prevent the engine from starting up, which is easy to detect. But for example, I found that my touchscreen buttons were not working anymore in the mobile browser at some point, which apparently was due to a disabled Godot Physics 2D option. Stuff like this is a lot harder to detect. I'm going to leave it at what we have now for this tutorial and instead show you one last trick. If you take a look at the files in the build directory, you can see that the biggest chunk, the WASM file, isn't compressed, making the download still quite big. Any modern web browser can transparently decompress files though, so we should make use of that. Theoretically, a properly configured web server could even automatically compress uploaded files and then serve those, but I personally haven't seen that working anywhere in practice. So let's walk through the process of making things work with a manually compressed WASM file. The first step is, of course, compressing the file. You can gzip it or use broadly the more modern compression algorithm these days. I'm using git bash here which features a broadly compression tool. This brings the file size down quite a bit. Next we need to replace the requested file names in the html and the js files. Yes I'm using vi because I'm old school, but you don't have to. Note that there is also a file size in the HTML file, but I have found that everything still works fine if I just leave that as is. The JS file has a couple more references we need to replace, so I'm using a search expression here. Note the backtick after the file suffix. We can now upload this prepared build to a server. If we did everything right, it should run as before, but with a much faster download. You probably don't want to do this manually every time you export a new build. I've wrote myself a small bash script to automate the task. You could easily do something like that in Python too. Obviously, there's still the packing up for distribution depending on the platform you are targeting, which could be automated using a script as well. Okay, so with all of this, we have reduced the download size of our simple web game from 42 to just 4 max. Not too bad, I think. You could probably shave off even more with enough tweaking, but I'll leave that to you. Hopefully you found these tips useful for your own web game projects. Let me know in the comments if you have any further insights or experiences, I'm still learning too. Hope to see you around for the next tutorial. And keep making games. Bye!